is to speed up and take you in a, a short time through the Sochi project, which is slightly problematic because the Sochi project is a long-term documentary project. Um, we've worked on this project for five years, since 2009 until 2014. Um, and it all started with this quote, uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia, in uh, Guatemala, where he was advertising, promoting the Olympic Games in, in Sochi. And finally, he won the bid and he got the Olympic Games in Sochi. And he mentioned over there in English, I don't know if he ever spoke English again after this, but he mentioned in English the Olympic family is going to feel at home in Sochi. And we thought, hmm, we're curious if that will happen. And we already worked in that area, in Abkhazia, and I've been in Russia multiple times before. So Arnold called me and said, like, I think we have to do a project around the Olympic Games in Sochi. And uh, that's how it all started. In 2008, we made plans. In 2009, we started. And we can go to the next slide. The way we started is by um, setting up a crowdfunding campaign. And that sounds very old-fashioned nowadays, but crowdfunding in 2009 was totally unknown. And it was a kind of kickstart for our project. Because with crowdfunding, which was seen in those days as something totally new and something totally questionable and maybe the future for uh, decreasing budgets uh, within the editorial market, um, we raised a lot of attention already for our projects and we slightly, slowly got some followers for the project. And we also started collaborating from the start together with designers. And these designers are Kummer and Hermann, a designing agency in Utrecht, and we collabor collaborated with them from start until end. And that's what you also see back, of course, in all the publications we made. There's a certain kind of design on these publications. Um, and they came up with this introduction newspaper, which we spread out everywhere on festivals, loading the trunk of the car uh, completely with these newspapers, that the car was completely uh, yeah, like that. And then uh, driving to festivals and promoting our project. That was a little bit the start of the project. And it's very important to know that it is a crowdfunding project because it largely influenced the project. Not the things we wanted to do over there, but the system of the project. Because we divided the project into chapters, and we divided the project into years, because the donators were donating money every year to the project. And we thought, if they donate money every year, and we have to motivate them to do it again the next year, then we need to give them a present at the end of the year. And the present became a book. So it largely influenced the whole system of the project. Maybe you can show the next slide. Um, this is a little bit the design concept for the whole project. We wanted to advocate for slow journalism and to motivate people to donate money to it by explaining to them that storytelling is not for free. And that sometimes that's something people hardly can believe in this digital era. Everybody's reading everything on the telephone for free. But um, there's a design concept behind it. Not so interesting to explain it right now, but you have to do at least something, put some energy in it to get this photo, to get it seen. And that was kind of concept behind it. We were aiming from the start for a couple of things. Um, we wanted to make, in those days we called it an atlas in words and images. Finally, what you see over here is the final result. It's an atlas of war and tourism in the Caucasus. We also wanted to have exhibitions, preferably around the Olympic Winter Games, um, and if possible, on many places in the world. And we had the ambition that also something from the start to show alternative stories of the region hosting the most expensive winter games ever. That's, that was the thing we tried to do. So we wanted to explore the whole area around Sochi and to bring alternative stories which you don't see um, by the, let's say, the, the normal ways which you don't see during the Olympic Winter Games normally. And we had a third ambition and that's to create an online documentary to make all our work in the end also available for free for everybody in the world. So if they are watching the Olympic Games and they are interested in alternative stories and they don't have the money to buy our book or they are not in a place where you can visit our exhibition, then at least everything would be also available online. That was our big ambition and here you see final results, so okay, um, we made it. 
Um, a little bit an introduction to the to the area. I'll stand over here. Um, now it seems very logical that when we started with the Sochi project, we didn't know we knew the area a little bit, but it wasn't so clear that as it is divided over here. Because in the end, we are talking clearly about three regions. First of all, in the left we have Sochi and the Sochi region. It's a little bit purple, and that's really touristic. So we divided it into themes. And, um, and made three different teams, three different regions. So Sochi, tourism, historical Sochi, and a place where they literally organized the winter games, but the winter games were organized on the coastline, but also up into the mountains, and from there you immediately enter the North Caucasus. The North Caucasus became the second region within the Sochi region. <laughs> Once again, we didn't decide this already from the start. It's, it's a natural process that it, in the end it's all divided into those regions etc. to make it more understandable as well for a large audience, very important. Um, and the third region is basically this region, Abkhazia. But Abkhazia is a breakaway republic from Georgia and that's why we also uh, uh, travel through Georgia to visit many Abkhazian refugees in Georgia. Um, so we have three regions, Abkhazia, Sochi region, tourism, Abkhazia is meant mostly about isolation, an independent country which is not recognized and where is no development. Uh, if you stand on the top of the main stadium of the Olympic Games, you can lit literally see the border of Abkhazia, so it's really, really close. Um, and then you have the North Caucasus, which is all about human rights, about poverty, it's the poorest region in Russia, it's the region where all the bomb attacks in Russia came from in the past years, etc. Uh, so that's basically the divide, and it also serves the title of the final project, an atlas of war and tourism in the Caucasus. It's all about extreme contrast. Extreme contrast in yeah, violence, for example, poor between rich, the most expensive winter games, $50 billion, and then the poorest region in the backyard. Uh, so many stories to tell about this region, and that's what we wanted to do. We started the whole um, tour, so to say, by making a book about sanatoriums. We first wanted to focus on historical Sochi. Um, so we discovered sanatoriums during our first trip and it appeared that the whole coastal line over there was filled with sanatoriums. And I don't know if you know a good Russian Soviet sanatorium, but it's the place where the old laborers went to clean their dust lawns and to uh, and where of course all the, the, the Brezhnevs and uh, etc. also went for their holiday. So it's beautiful over there, it's subtropical as you can see. All those many high rise buildings are kind of sanatoriums or nowadays tourist uh, hotels. Um, we specifically wanted to capture this old Sochi in the sanatorium life because that's what all the Russians remember as well from Sochi the paradise, the pearl. Um, and we wanted to capture it before it would disappear because there was a big ambition to transform all these sanatoriums into four or five star hotels before the Olympic Winter Games because imagine that foreigners see those old crappy Soviet sanatoriums that would be a disaster. Russia is of course very modern uh, so it needed to be transformed and we wanted to capture this old Soviet life before it disappeared. This is a short introduction film uh, about sanatorium, sanatorium life and the current situation at that moment in Sochi. It's nice because you also see a little bit of Sochi itself. Now I'm going to talk. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we don't have sound for the video, but we can read probably the subtitles. Besides that, I don't know if you speak right now. <laughs> so we decided to stay for two weeks in this sanatorium, Sanatorium Metal. Thank you. 
COVID starts at 8 o'clock at night. Um, we try to participate in every part of this uh, sanatorium. So we signed up for the sanatorium, which is very complicated because the sanatorium is not on booking.com or whatever. So you have to go there and buy a Puchovka. Puchovka is a special ticket that you can enter the sanatorium. Once you enter the sanatorium, the main doctor will knock on your door and says, like, you have to follow me and then you are t t totally like your body is investigated. What's all wrong with you? And if you don't speak any Russian, it's quite complicated to make clear what's not totally correct. But we also wanted to make sure that we got treatments, because the sanatorium is about treatments, of course. And if we, to be honest, we were healthy, but we had to make up some things to get, of course, the treatments in the sanatorium. What you see over here is that I get an electrically loaded clay treatment for my back. It's already a little bit red under it. Um, the thing is actually, and it makes it also kind of funny for us to work over there, um, we didn't understand the word at that moment. We were learning Russian and by going to the sanatorium we felt like we were learning quicker because nobody there speaks English. And that means also it's totally not focusing on international guests, it's only focusing on the Russian dedicated community who's traveling there every year to get those treatments. They pay a little amount of money for it. And, uh, and this is, for example, the situation that you are lying there as a foreigner getting the treatment and the uh, lady over there, she puts in the electricity, charges up the volume and she says in Russian, you have to say stop at the moment that it starts hurting. But that's of course something you don't know as a foreigner. Um, so in a way we had a lot of fun, but what we tried to do is to, to capture the real spirit inside a, a sanatorium. So uh, the treatments, um, the dancing in, in the evening, so the disco, Arnold is a very good dancer, um, but also the afternoon program on the beach that's like about resting and about uh, uh, fun, those kind of things. Um, and in that, way, in that way we tried to really capture the spirit. Arnold wrote a beautiful uh, story in the back of this book uh, in, in, uh, in which he mentioned that he was one of the, let's say, long-time visitors of this sanatorium interviewing many people over there. Um, this is a treatment in a bath tube in which the boy had like burns on his feet and he got special like this sulfide water over his burns. Um, and we made a small little publication out of it. It's a kind of dedication to the old sanatorium life, expecting that this sanatorium would have been transformed as well into a four or five star hotel. It closed a year after and it started reconstructing. I can already tell you that it was still closed during the Olympic Games. So we wanted to go back, but we didn't get the opportunity to go back. And that happened with many sanatoriums. I think they are open now. Maybe. I don't know. It was the first publication, very small, kind of present to our donators. And then uh, we felt like we're going to continue with those small publications. That went totally wrong in the year after. <laughs> Yeah, I shortly come back to the big publication that is, uh, is, uh, is, is meaning. You see them here, the giant books we wrote in the years after. We also made some small publications like these, the sketchbooks we call them, and this newspaper on the other side of the mountains, we have them here. It's maybe uh, one of our favorite publications of the Sochi project. Um, we wanted for the European Month of Photography, we were asked to make a small mobile exhibition that could travel all around Europe. So we could make a sort of framed uh, traditional exhibition, but we saw a chance that we could now make something that people could take home and we could send abroad and we could um, uh, share our stories with a much larger audience. Uh, that became a newspaper and like Rob said in the beginning, it's also thanks to our designers, I think, and the collaboration between us and our designers that made it so uh, beautiful and 
so beautiful that I think it's still my favorite publication uh, in the Sochi project. It's a very small story actually. It's a story about a small village on the other side of the mountains, so on the other side of Sochi actually. In the North Caucasus is our first publication in the North Caucasus. Uh, it's a village where actually nothing happens, but it's a complete symbol for what happens in Russia. The factories are gone, uh, many people are jobless, most men have disappeared to the big cities to find a job in building and construction uh, work. Uh, and some people are left behind and the old farms are, um, are disappearing. Together with the designers we decided to make this into a beautiful newspaper which you can actually read as a newspaper. So you can just go through it page by page by page. But the special thing, and this is something we still use actually, is that when you have two newspapers, you can fold them out and put them against the wall or hang them anywhere you want. So all of a sudden we had this exhibition for uh, the European Month of Photography, but also we had something people could take home when they were an, at the exhibition. So this was a fantastic old-fashioned way, actually, because it's, 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 it's a newspaper, a very old-fashioned way to share our stories and to have exhibitions all over the world. So in the end, as you can see in this picture, we had exhibitions in Indonesia, in Colombia, in Russia, in all through Europe. And for like five euros, we could send a new exhibition anywhere we wanted. It was a very democratic exhibition and a great way to tell a very crucial story, I think, uh, which tells a contrast between the Olympic Games, the $50 billion Olympic Games, and a very poor, isolated village just 100 kilometers away from, uh, from Sochi. But at the same time, we were working on a monster publication. We already traveled through Abkhazia, so the small country you saw be south, south of uh, Sochi at the Black Sea coast. We traveled there in 2006 and 2007, and it actually was the start of our big project. So we traveled back and back and back in 2008 and 9 and 10, and we were wondering how can we make a meaningful story about, about this country. The funny thing is that when you explain Abkhazia, to people who never heard about Abkhazia, they start laughing. They say, oh, it must be some kind of fairy tale country, you know? It must be some kind of, you know, it's almost like the cliche of what the Soviet Union was or Russia was, something too exotic that, it, uh, that people actually don't believe it really exists. So we played a little bit with that idea. Our book, as you can see, it, it has a very beautiful uh, cover. Rob always says that it, because it's self-published, we could choose this cover. Any publisher, any official publisher would have uh, denied us to make this cover because it's only a landscape and you can hardly see the title of the book. You can see a little bit that it's imprinted on the front cover. Um, our book starts with actually a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale of Abkhazia still about the, the way Abkhazia once started. That it was God's chosen country. And in the end, the Abkhazians were so hospitable and so friendly to all people that were passing that they were too late at the meeting where God distributed all the land. But God loved the Abkhazians and he said, okay, you were so friendly, you're such a nice people, you can have my land. And it's actually a story that all the people in the Caucasus tell themselves. So every nation has the same story uh, copied from each other, I guess. So every nation thinks they have God's chosen country. But when you enter our story from this beautiful cover, you enter this fairy tale, but then you see a uh, real Abkhazia. Oh, I think it's quite nice to let her talk for a second, yeah. I mean, this is Angela and we met her on the university. Um, I hope you... Oh, no, we have to skip it, I think, because it's... Yeah, I think you can't going. hear it because we don't have any sound. No. It's Angela and she actually is... She was our fixer, our translator in Abkhazia. And um, through her we were really able to discover the, the, the country. At the same time she was a fantastic promotional figure and once we sat down and said, okay, you know what? We're journalists, we're here, get the chance to promote your country. Show to our people, our donators, uh, our readers, our, our viewers, what Abkhazia is really like. And she told this fantastic, again a little bit, fairy tale story about Abkhazia. But once you go through the book, the fairy tale gets less and less, and you see that this tiny country, of course, has a lot of trouble um, making it, actually. How can you be such a tiny, small country in a world where everything is about legal uh, arrangements or recognition of one another? They are not uh, recognized by almost any country 
except for Russia and Venezuela, Nauru and Tuvalu and a few other small tiny countries. So that's very strange. We decided, okay, we're gonna, we, we're gonna describe how can you survive living in this country for so many times in an, uh, in an unrecognized country. How does the prison work? How does social security work? How does it work with TBC patients? What kind of man is the president? And the funny thing, of course, that because it's such a small country, you can get anywhere. So we indeed visited the prison. We visited the president actually many times. And all the ministers, which are actually located in one single flat building uh, in, the, in the capital. So from this fairy tale, we made our own fairy tale, which has a much more dark uh, side to it. The funny thing is that while nobody knows the country, this became one of our more popular books. And maybe it's also because one of our first reviews was uh, from Andrew Phelps in Austria and he said, wow, this is one of the first photo books I actually uh, took with me in bed. And he started reading in bed and when he, uh, you can see the photos are um, uh, put in another direction than the text. You can read the text uh, like this, like a normal book. And when you turn a book one quarter, you can see, uh, go through it as a photo book. So Andrew Phelps read in his review, this is more like a, a book you take to bed indeed, and maybe that's part of the, of the success of it. In the end, we um, uh, sold, the, the book sold out within a, within a year or so, and then we went back in 2013, and we took this picture and uh, on Facebook, put it on Facebook and said we were going to make a second edition. We're going to see what's the development in this country within a few years, uh, update the book. And uh, make a second edition, and that became this book, a much smaller edition. And also, this one, strangely enough, about this completely unknown country, is quite, uh, quite popular. Um, this is actually an important thing on our uh, on our project. During the project, we had a Facebook and Twitter page, and slowly we recognized that this is so much more important than having your own website. We put our own website. It was in the shape of a newspaper, more or less. A little bit New York Times inspired, so we wanted to have a blog and a news page and everything. But people, of course, don't come to your website. They come there maybe once or twice. But when you're on Facebook, when you're on Twitter, when you're on YouTube, YouTube when you're on the places where people are, then you get much more audience. So this picture, for instance, was uh, uh, gained a huge audience. People liked it, that we could show, hey, we've been on this spot four years ago, and we're back, and we're making a second edition. So it showed that we were uh, dedicated to the area in a sense, and I think that dedication really was what um, people liked, uh, people who followed the project. And what we wanted. Um, uh, by the way, one small minor detail about the second edition, we replaced some photos by updated photos. So we made new photos, but many people never noticed that we changed the photos, because the photos simply looked the same. And that's basically the concept of the second edition. In this country, nothing is changing. Although they promised that it would change towards the Olympic Winter Games, they thought they would benefit, they would profit from having the Olympic Winter Games in their backyard. But unfortunately, they didn't profit from it. And it was even worse, because six months before the Olympic Winter Games, they locked off the border with Abkhazia and Sochi Olympic Winter Games. So that means that journalists and nobody was actually allowed to see this poor little country in the backyard of the Olympic Games. And I don't think you have read about it in any newspaper. It's a kind of, it's a totally neglected area, really on a stone throw from these 50 billion dollar games. Bringing me to the next chapter. And once again, I told you already, this project is a project of contrast. And in the third year, we went back to Sochi, while working already in the North Caucasus, but not publishing about it. And um, uh, we, we decided to try to capture modern life tourism in Sochi. And that became uh, finally the book Sochi Singers. What you see over here, we wanted to capture, let's say, the daily life of a modern tourist, modern Russian tourist, because there are not many foreign tourists in Sochi, um, uh, in Sochi. And, uh, and the day looks like this. It's, you book a hotel, uh, then you go to the beach, there you start drinking. Uh, this, is, this is typical Sochi view. It looks quite beautiful, but that's because I took it during twilight. Um, and. Uh, you can continue as well. And you go to the beach and you drink uh, a couple of vodka or beer or whatever. And then everybody's tired and they go to a restaurant in the evening hours and they're sitting there and they're ordering, of course, shashik or those kind of things. 
and drinking a little bit more. And then around 8 o'clock, a singer comes on stage. And we noticed this already a couple of times before, because we're now in 2011 already, and uh, we've, we've heard this and seen this since 2009, and we started to get a little bit frustrated about it. Because we are not sitting in a restaurant because we have we have a lot of fun, of course, but we're not sitting there to enjoy like going to a restaurant, but we have a dinner and we talk with each other about what to do the next day and what to do a little bit discussing about the previous day, etc, etc. And then the singer comes in and takes the laptop out and starts singing and that means literally every end of the conversation, of every conversation. It's absolutely impossible to continue talking when the singer starts singing their karaoke songs. Um, and at a certain point I was a little bit frustrated about it and that was the moment that we decided maybe this is an interesting topic to focus on because the whole Sochi, tourism in Sochi and actually the whole attitude of Sochi, the whole atmosphere in Sochi is based around this tourism, in winter it's totally silent over there and in summer you have this tourism and people don't do anything else than going to the beach and uh, going to the restaurants and that's basically it, all Sochi is earning their money with it and the tourists are doing that and then you can try to make a very multi-layered story about Sochi, like we did in Abkhazia, and like we also will do in the North Caucasus, but it doesn't make sense to make a multi-layered story about a completely empty place. So we decided to try to uh, visualize Sochi, the feeling we had over there, in these kind of images. And um, uh, uh, we decided to travel along the coastline, visit every restaurant available over there. It's a very long coastline, 140 kilometers, so we have many, many restaurants. I think we visited approximately yeah, 120, 140 restaurants. There were 70 suitable to make an image, because sometimes you have mirrors in the back or those kind of things, not enough des distance to the stage. And then we made a selection of 35 images out of it. And for me, uh, because I've had many discussions about this project, but I still completely stand behind it because if you see this book, I think you will get the right feeling of Sochi. This is really Sochi. This is really the, the feeling which you have to remember about Sochi. If you're walking around over there and you think you will see anything of the bling bling 50 billion dollar games, no, you won't see it over there. That's only a bubble created 30 kilometers south from Sochi. There's a bubble with a few expensive stadiums, quite useless nowadays. Um, but if you want to see what Sochi is uh, nowadays, tourism in Sochi, then this gives you a really good uh, feeling. And I like it because there's a kind of contemporary bling bling in these kind of images, in these kind of interiors. And I feel especially that the, the need or the urge from Russians to try to change these restaurants into a more modernized restaurant. But how do you change a style? Imagine you come from Soviet times and then in Sochi time still stood still uh, until 2000, 2005 and then they had the feeling like okay there's money coming in and etc etc let's make it more modern but what kind of style do you choose at the moment that you have a kind of cultural heritage and you try to have a new cultural heritage where can you find your new style where do you where do you get this and that's what you really see back in these uh, 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 newly manufactured uh, interiors which they have over there. If you, for example, go back, I really like uh, interiors like this, uh, having a Swiss castle in the background, so we investigated what's happening. By the way, the toilet signs are also very, very uh, often near the states. I don't know why they do it. This is a very rocky new uh, state. And then this one I also like a lot, that you have those kind of creek pillars, or I don't know exactly what it is. So I came, and here you have kind of Middle East background. So they pick out, maybe from travel folders or whatever, they pick out a new style for their restaurant. The question of to ask, what's the new Russian style at this moment? So I, I understand that you want to get rid of a certain culture, but how do you get a new culture? That's basically the question I'm also asking in this uh, whole series. Um, finally, it took us a very long time before we know knew how to exhibit this work as well. Basically, it cost us one and a half year. Uh, we were asked for many exhibitions of such things because it won a World Press Photo Award, which was extremely surprising to us that, especially this series, won a World Press Photo Award. Um, but um, it, it gained a lot of attention, and also many requests from institutions that say, like, we want to exhibit such things, can you send the file, we will frame them and hang them. We always had the feeling that's not correct, we shouldn't do that. So we 
we refused everything and we didn't know what to do with it until the moment that together with the designers again we were sitting and we finally came up with the idea to make um, billboards with our composer and if you get closer to the billboards you will see how artificial they are uh, they are becoming more and more artificial because they are like made from these really big pixelated things so that's something I, uh, I really like about the presentation of these billboards and I think if you go further then you see once again what you also notice with this newspaper we always try to make work which is in a way also suitable to work in a machine but also communicates outside a machine a machine is not a holy place for us so it's nice if a machine wants to show our work but we want to communicate also outside machines and um, there was a Brussels bookstore, bookshop keeper who said like I have those shutter doors, those roll doors and these roll doors come down at 8 o'clock and that's the moment that the, that the singer usually comes on stage in Sochi so if I mount a singer on my roll door then uh, it exactly comes down at 8 o'clock and she disappears early in the morning again and I thought like that's a brilliant idea to use this work as well to bring it into the world not only into museums so, um, okay, next step yeah, sorry, we have a small amount of time, so we have to hurry up. This is our actually our final chapter before we make the big uh, final book and the final exhibition. This is our chapter about the North Caucasus. And what Rob told in the beginning, that we separated our um, uh, project in three themes, actually, or three regions, the North Caucasus, Abkhazia, and Sochi. This was the most dangerous part, of course, of our project, because North Caucasus is uh, a region uh, hunted by violence, uh, human rights violations, uh, war. Um, so we have to, I think, treat this subject most carefully. Uh, tourism in Sochi is harmless. Abkhazia, we had full entrance to uh, up, up until the president. But here um, we had to do with many, many different security services and police. Also, because for us the essence of the North Caucasus is the history of violence and, violence and conflict, of course. This is the history of human rights violations and of these wars. And also this violence, wars and poverty were the most heavy contrast with what is going on in Sochi. Uh, very corrupt 50 billion dollar games in contrast to what's happening on the other side of the mountains as poverty, wars and, and, and conflict. We, you can see here uh, this uh, picture our uh, translator took and fixer took a little bit trembling as you can see when we were caught by the police in uh, Gimli and the police took us to this police station and we spent all day there and being interrogated by many different services in this police station because they didn't want us to be there to research this uh, separatism which is ongoing in the North Caucasus, separatism against the Russian uh, government. You have to imagine in the North Caucasus many different peoples live who actually for centuries um, don't want anything to do with Moscow or with uh, any occupation as they call it. So we were arrested many many times uh, and actually this is the reason, this project is the reason that we can't enter Russia anymore. We were banned from Russia after doing this project um, and I think that's in the hindsight we're so happy that we put this book, but that we made, the, uh, made this book only in the end of our project, so we could do all our projects and then we're kicked out of Russia. So it was great timing by Russia as well. <laughs> it all ended in this book, A History of Violence and Conflict in the North Caucasus, The Secret History of Gava Gaisanova in the North Caucasus. Uh, the way we made this book was in a different way than the other books. It was almost done anthropologically. You have to imagine that Rob and I went from village to village, from town to town, and knocked doors and knocked doors and started collecting all these different family stories and histories of all these different people and different uh, nations in the North Caucasus to get a real grip on what was going on there because it's such a complex history and we wanted to somehow make it more uh, uh, easy, so to say, how to, to make it more uh, understandable for our readers and viewers. In the end it came down after we went through all our notebooks and photo series and stories it came down to the history of this uh, single uh, woman Gava uh, Garsanova. We found out that in her family history, the whole history of violence and conflict of the entire North Caucasus were actually uh, actually came together. Um, her family was um, forcefully moved from the mountains to the lower uh, plains by the Russians in the end of the 19th century. They were um, banned from the North Caucasus to Kazakhstan, 
in the 1940s by Stalin, and when they came back in the 1970s, they had to fight to get a house again. And in the 1990s, after all these civil wars in this region, Gava's husband uh, was kidnapped and is missed up until now, and most probably uh, killed. At least officially, he's killed now. The judge says. So she became the main character of our uh, story on the North Caucasus, her family history. And we did that through by going through a personal archive and by sitting at her kitchen table for days and days in a row and trying to make sense of her family tree, her genealogy, her uh, history and talking to many uh, people in her family. Uh, so we reconstructed her family history and with that the family, the history of finance and company in the Caucasus. You can see how we build up our book. In the second chapter, it's called Gave by Shanavan. The fourth chapter is called Kazakhstan. That's about the exile. The seventh chapter is Return and Decay. That's about uh, a sixth, Happy Childhood. That's about the childhood of Gava in, 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 in Kazakhstan. And the eighth chapter is the beginning of the end, when all the uh, turmoil st starts in the North Caucasus. So you can see the first and the third and the fifth chapters, so the uneven chapters. They're like the general chapters. In those chapters, we tell all the stories which Gava tells us, but then in a general sense. So we combine Gava's stories with the more, with all the other stories we anthropologically uh, got together in the North Caucasus, and also by interviewing politicians and policemen and uh, security service, Russians, historians in the region. So we somehow interweaved Gava's personal history with the bigger history of the North Caucasus, and in that way, I think. Uh, if you read the book, we somehow made sense of this so complex history um, by making it small and personal, uh, but by giving you the chance to dive into history as well. This is Gabe's husband, actually. And so you can see, uh, if, you, if, you, if you see this book, you can all, 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 all also see from the, from the slides that it's made a little bit unusually. It's the same paper we used for the, um, uh, for the do-it-yourself exhibition, the on the other side of the mountains. It's made on newspaper print. And I think it was mostly the um, idea of Rob and the designers. They said, okay, we can make this book and do it in a traditional way and make it into a beautiful book. But hey, it, it doesn't fit into the subject. This subject is so urgent. It's about such cruel and terrible stories. Uh, it's such an important story. Somehow the whole urgency of this project should come from its pages as well, you know? When you have the book in your hands, you should already feel something uh, different. So in the end, we decided to do this on newspaper print as well. And it makes it much more in an urgent story. And it, also the funny thing is, of course, that it, uh, the, 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 this book um, uh, was put into the tradition of all our newspaper prints we did before. So it became a typical uh, the Sochi project publication as well. So you read and watch a documentary story, uh, because it's a, it's a story which is not published that much in the normal newspapers and, uh, and magazines. But because of the newspaper print, we give it the same urgency um, um, as newspapers. We almost say and shout, come on, read this and share this story. Uh, it's important, especially in these days. Uh, one of the most difficult things, but maybe it's more up to Rob to tell this, was how can, can you uh, photograph, how can you visualize this history of conflict and violence? I mean, you can somehow photograph this history, but then you end up with this kind of uh, photographs, but you of course want more. So we had to go quite close to the conflict. Of course, luckily enough, you never know when a bomb explodes or when something terrible happens, when something gets shut down. But you can try and uh, see the immediate, immediate aftermath of that. So that's what our main purpose was in the um, in our trips to the North Caucasus. And we ended up uh, photographing so many policemen and victims, and in the end, the people we photographed, because we photographed them and interviewed them, because we knew that we were right in the center of this conflict, even died after uh, we visited them, not immediately after, and nothing to do with our visit, of course, but they were, in the end, um, uh, uh, they were really part of this conflict, and later we read that they uh, died. So here you have policemen. This is a policeman that was bombed by a separatist and he lost his uh, feet and his one arm and uh, the side of his eyes. Another policeman uh, who's partly blinded by uh, a terror attack. This is of course a, a very famous story but really cruel if you're there in Beslan 
in North Ossetia, where an entire school was bombed uh, and trapped uh, by uh, terrorist groups. This girl, uh, you can see the quote, still has nightmares of this period. And uh, you can see in her face as well that she's really scarred by what happened to her in this school. This was one of the of the men that was most trusted within this, in the schemes of radical Muslims and separatism in Dagestan. And while I was writing the book, so we, we were here in March or April and in, uh, throughout summer and September I was writing the book and then I got news that he got killed as well. He was uh, uh, pulled out of his car with, with his wife and uh, daughter inside and shot through the head by masked men. And most likely these were men of the um, local security services. Here we are in. This is maybe the most cynical uh, 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 of all. You can see his quote, and this quote he gave us when he was going through a magazine, and he showed a photo of all imams and religious uh, people of the North Caucasus. People are allied with the uh, Russian government as well. And he said, well, look at all these imams. They're all dead. Every one of them, of them was blown up or shot by extremists. And I think it was at the end of writing the book, around December, January 2013, uh, that we got news that also he uh, got killed, uh, blown up in his car uh, with an auto bump. This is the, maybe the main quote that's also in our exhibition about, about this region. On paper, human rights are actually quite well defined here, but of course, when you go through this region and you see what's really going on, it has nothing to do with any uh, law or uh, uh, basic human rights uh, whatsoever. So that's the mo most important part of our book. And then came the final year and we were banned from Russia and had somehow to put all these stories together in, in one book. Maybe you can say something about yeah, this. Yeah, also a little bit about visualizing the North Caucasus, which is of course uh, very uh, difficult. If Arnold, for example, says like we have to talk about the history of violence, how do you photograph the history of violence? I'm, I've been struggling with it and I'm not going deep, uh, too deep into it because that will cost me two hours to explain how to deal with it. Uh, and I didn't find a solution, of course. But one of the solutions we also found was that, for example, you saw an image of a blown up liquor store, and we, we went there. And of course, it's difficult to photograph, or maybe boring to photograph a blown up liquor store. But then we also collected materials from the people over there, and it appeared that they had security camps inside the liquor store. And if you go now to the exhibition, then you can see the security camps from this liquor, st liquor store, and you will see that it ends with a big explosion. Uh, which is quite fascinating to see how it's all managed, these, uh, these explosions. And you also will see a video of a boy who was abducted by security forces, also coincidentally captured by secu uh, security camps, because the boy was the son of a father who had a car repair. And this, uh, within this car repair, he had like several security camps. And fortunately, they recorded, and this, the, the security forces, of course, didn't know about these camps. So you see them entering, you see how it all works, you see the whole process, how they approach the, 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 the uh, car repair with, with anonymous cars, so you don't see anything from security force or Russian force or whatever, and then they enter with their black leather jackets and their huge machine guns and those kind of things, and they capture someone, and, and fortunately within this story, the security camps really saved this boy because usually when this happens you will never find a boy back like that and it happens very very often still in the North Caucasus um, and, um, and in this case the father realized I have these films and I'm going to a lawyer and this lawyer sent the films to the police office and the police office decided apparently to release this boy so they dumped him out of the police station in front of the police station and there he fell, he, he fell on the ground and, and he managed to get a telephone from passing uh, from a lady who passed by and he called his father and his father picked him up but his back was already broken and he was severely uh, uh, tortured by the police over there as well so apparently they thought like okay they have video cams over there so now we need to release him otherwise he would have been dead for sure and we've been ourselves as well after these arrests uh, fortunately we haven't been, I mean they, they, the only thing they try to do with us is intim intimidate for example and you saw the first image of us standing there with police catch uh, and then at a certain point after being interrogated by four different uh, services uh, which means local security service, anti-terrorist brigade, migration service, normal police etc etc um, they also decided to bring us down to these cellars, to these basements of the police office and we know, we've heard so many stories there and that's the place where they always torture, that's the place where they always 
uh, take the so-called insurgents or young boys with long beards and that's the place where they start torturing them. Um, so it's very intimidating to be brought over there and that's what they knew of course, the, the security services as well. They wanted to show it like, okay, this is the place where you don't want to be, so better get out of here. Um, and, and that's how it really works over there. It's very intense working with all Congress and we give you a zillion more examples in this book. Um, and also if you walk to the exhibition, although that's an introduction to the larger stories. Finally, it all came together in the last publication in which we collected all these stories or combined all these stories uh, and really we're focusing on all these large contrasts. So you can, that, that's literally the geographical area over there. You can be on the coastline with a Sochi singer and thinking like, ha ha ha, he's singing now very loud and people are drunk and it's kind of fun. The next day you can be also on the sofa with this policeman who got blown up and uh, lost his legs and his arm and his side and his eyes and still has to take care for four daughters. Um, so it, it's so extremely intense in the North Caucasus and these contrasts are so extremely big and that's actually what we try to achieve in the final publication, that you're going through it and you're having fun at one moment and at the other moment you're going to, let's say, deep depression by, by what you see over there. Um, so th this became the last uh, chapter. Uh, what you see over here is the the quote we used again from Vladimir Putin as kind of entrance to the book and what you see over here, we will finish, so you see some chapters from the book, you can go through it and end and with the final video. And the book sold out, it was printed by Apogee in quite a large edition, but there was fortunately a lot of interest and we also needed Apogee and all the promotion possible. And what we literally did was of course, like Russia, I told it a few times already, uh, Russia used the games as a propaganda tool for themselves and we thought it's totally fair that we use your, your games as a propaganda tool for the other stories as well. So during the games we sold uh, thousands of books and uh, had a lot of uh, attention for the stories and that's ac exactly the uh, ambition we had with this project. The book sold out and we have a, uh, what, what do you call it? We have a premiere. Yeah, premiere here, yeah, because I got five new copies sent from uh, China where it's being printed by Aperture uh, Publishing. This is the second edition of the web book. It will be released in a month. Right now I expect the books within a month uh, from now. What you see on the cover of this book is the quote, which is done by the CEO of Sochi 2014. Um, during his end speech, broadcasted live in many, many, many countries, of course, end speech of the Olympic Winter Games, um, and he mentioned there, uh, this is the new phase of Russia, our Russia. And we thought, okay, if you use this again for the Olympic Winter Games and you are so proud of it, then we are totally allowed to use your beautiful slogan as well for our project. So this is the new phase of Russia, our Russia, according to us. Um, the book is mm, almost available again. Um, we have one copy which is sealed and one copy which is a viewing copy. If you want a sealed copy, then you need to be quick. And we want to end the story with our introduction movie, um, on which we use also on um, on our website. And I think that's a kind of good summary and at the same time introduction to our project.
Questions? Yeah. Um, so my question is because I've been following the project since the beginning, and I have to say, by the end of it, it was very impressive it was still happening because people do really start things and sometimes they don't work. Do you think that the fact that you actually made it through had something to do with the fact that there's two of you? Do you think that each one of you would have been able by yourself? Or the, the fact that there was two of you supporting each other? You know, it, it feels very safe at least to travel with the two of you. And also when you're arrested, you're not alone and getting nervous because you can joke with each other. But I don't know, I think I, and I know some single journalists who just were writers, so to say, and also photographers and photographers who did it by themselves, made, I think, with a fixer as well, or some local producer. Uh, so that's possible as well. We know some very good stories made in the North Caucasus. But I think for us, it, it, it at least it gave something extra to the stories as well, to travel together. I think actually I want to contribute something, because I slightly disagree with Arnold. I think this project couldn't have been done by one person, because we both worked for 60 hours a week at least on this project. And it's, it's been so intense and so much work and uh, Arnold brought in totally different knowledge as an art historian and writer as I do. And we combine this kind of knowledge and experience together. Um, yeah, maybe there's a... No, I don't believe this could be done by one person. It's kind of impossible. It's simply due to the time that you need to invest in it. But of course, it doesn't say that projects like this can't be done by one person. We probably either need more time or you need to make it a little bit smaller. But yeah. we needed each other at least. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Speaking of covers, uh, why did you choose the, uh, the photo for the address cover? What is the context of that photo? Mm -hmm. Why did you choose that one? Well, there are many reasons to choose this girl for the, for the cover of the Atlas. First of all, we want to have a kind of warm welcome within Atlas, which fits to the whole concept of contrast. And she is, a, she is the manager and a welcoming girl in Striptease Club uh, in Shim Jushina, um, a hotel where we stay very, very often. Um, and secondly, we have tried many images under the title. That's a practical pro problem, of course. But if you start searching, we knew the title, and that was a war on tourism in the Caucasus. We wanted to have something uh, which was a kind of in between the two titles. And we only felt that this image was suitable for it. Um, and probably that has to do with the fact that striptease is very um, present in, in tourism, but it's also very present of, often in war. You can ask any war <laughs> about it. Um, and uh, um, I don't ignore the fact that when seats on the cover, it will absolutely raise a lot of attention. You will see the cover when it's in the shop. And I told you already that we had an ambition to get outside the photography and our world. We wanted to make it bigger. We had a story to tell and we were hoping or aiming to, to bring it further than only like this thousand copies uh, uh, inside photography world. We wanted to go further. And um, uh, this was of course a very beautiful cover. It will appeal people to see it. So it had like a different variety of reasons to do this. And also not to use her again, for example, and to put this quote now on the cover and only to keep it to a quote. Um, that's also because like, for now the, the focus is much more only on the front, not so much more about this huge gigantic Olympic Winter Games propagandistic tools. Um, but now we try to prolong the project and to bring it, to let, let it continue. Because the story really didn't change. I mean, the story we tell is not about Olympic Winter Games. It's about contemporary Russia. And Russia didn't change in the past year. It only became worse, actually, in that sense our book was a preface of what was coming. So, we slightly adapted some text, but that's more or less it. The content is still the same. And it is still the same. Mm -hmm. uh, are you still in touch with uh, the woman whose husband was kidnapped and her family? Do you know, do you have any idea how they are doing today? We've been, uh, uh, I think, the last, the last year uh, or half year we haven't been in contact anymore. Uh, but before, when you know, when the games were there, and afterwards, uh, through our fixer in Moscow, uh, she's an Ossetian woman, and we traveled with her for some reasons. We somehow called her sometimes, you know, what's going on. Uh, in the end, because we made her the main person of the book, so she was on the cover, and 
when you go through the book, you can see that we even used uh, a facsimile of her, of her uh, husband's photo book. So we uh, used a facsimile of her husband's photo book within the book. So we thought, okay, you know, your story really has become our story as well, so we have to do something in return. So that's how we crowdfunded money among our donors. So the donors of the Sochi project, they brought together thousands of euros actually to build her a new life more or less. So in the end we, we facilitated her a new shop uh, in her house. So she, she um, uh, built the shop and we bought all the equipment. And that was more or less like the sort of return gift. Afterwards we called her a few times and her shop has been called the Orange Tulip because we're Dutch so people thought that was a fitting name. <laughs> and, um, and the last thing I heard that was that it goes well with her and her family. Uh, but the last year, or a little bit less than a year, we haven't made contact anymore now. Isn't there a, like, a small chance that that kind of uh, exposure uh, would, you know, uh, bring them in trouble somehow with the authorities or, you know, secret yeah. Because I guess they don't like attention. Right? Yeah, it's always possible, of course. That's what we always say, especially to her, of course, because she became one of the uh, center, central uh, people in our book. That we always say, Are you, do you agree, you know, that we use your story and we use your photo book and we use all your archives and family history in such a way? And we, of course, said we want to do that because we want to tell this and that story. Your family history is so fitting for that story. So we try to make people really aware of that. And she already, of course, was in a huge conflict with her government because she was trying to find out what happened to her husband. She knew the government was one of the forces behind this disappearance. She was fighting this government, uh, so she was already sort of uh, opposing this government. Uh, and for her, maybe this was part of this campaign against the government uh, that she would put herself in such a situation. We never heard of one of our characters directly or indirectly even that they got in, into any trouble thanks to our publications. And we, of course, interviewed so many people and used so many people images. I think we had to, a few times people said afterwards, okay, we, you can't use our image or you can't use my story, that they started a little bit panicking, but then we didn't do that. So, but I, I never heard people got into trouble thanks to us. Of course, people got into trouble after we visited them, but not thanks to us, I think. I think you also have to realize that people in the North Caucasus are very well aware of what can happen if you speak to journalists and when they decide to speak to you, usually these people made a conscious decision while knowing that etc. etc. Uh, as Hafa, uh, she had huge problems with the authorities already because he wasn't afraid at all. He wanted to bring a story out of the world. And that's with most of these people we interviewed. So we also got many no's of course. Uh, people who say like, no, no journalists. They want to, they don't want to talk. So they are more experienced in North Caucasian uh, yeah, things happening than we are, basically. But we are always totally honest. We don't hide anything. We are journalists, we are writers, so we don't pretend that we are doing secret things or whatever. And we try to keep up with them, so we try to follow them as long as possible. And, yeah. and for example, the man killed, Nasibov, the guy with the beard, he was talking to many journalists. And he was very well aware of the fact that things would happen to him as well. But he lost all his sons, three sons. They said, like, I don't care about it anymore. I want this story to be told. This should go into the world. If you stop writing about it, they can do whatever they want. So he actually predicted his own death in this book already. So he, yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's very hard and very. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a sad situation of that. Any more questions? Was there any reactions from the uh, Netherlands? Was there any reactions from your public and the Olympic Committee in the Netherlands? And did they have any empathy towards? Yeah, the reaction was that they sent the biggest delegation ever to Sochi. <laughs> our crown prince, no, our, our, our king, king, I mean. <laughs> Uh, prime Minister, etc., etc. And Holland is very practical. If it's about money, economical deals, then they, for one second, don't think about human rights anymore. So, was I ashamed of being a Dutch? Yeah, absolutely. It's a shame on the government.
did you exhibit your project in, uh, in Russia? The Contemporary Art Center, and 10 days before the opening, we announced that we were not allowed to go back to Russia anymore. We were on the blacklist. And within a week, they cancelled the exhibition, which was a really huge scheduled exhibition with a lot of money involved. And I think that was the last time for the upcoming zillion years that we can exhibit in Russia. Well, we had a, we had a um, thanks to that cancellation, we had a shadow exhibition, but it was like nothing. It was only like six photos, maybe, or ten photos, and hastily put up in the Sakharov Human Rights Center in Moscow. So, like, it's the, the center of the opposition movement in, in Moscow, and they said, okay, you're banned from Russia, you're banned from having this exhibition here, let us make a guerrilla exhibition in this uh, opposition center. And that was really fantastic. We opened it through Skype, so we had our own uh, gathering in Amsterdam, and we commun communicated through Skype, and they opened the exhibition there officially and had a great night there with our uh, stuff and photos, and um, there's at least a little bit of uh, compensation for this uh, stupid story. And of course we had our uh, an earlier exhibition, which is the newspaper exhibition. We sent a huge crate of newspapers to this village, we documented, and they put it up in their school and we were completely proud that they had their own exhibition about themselves. Yeah, and I need to add one more thing. The side effect, and that's so stupid about these governments and these cancellations, the side effect is that a project like this gets way more attention than it would ever have had if you had an exhibition over there. So we had, we had like, even in Russia, an old alternative box, Lenta, one of the biggest ones, with hundreds of thousands of, of, of viewers per day. Um, we had like so much attention for the project, and we, of course, we took care that the whole website was translated at the moment we heard about this blacklist and visa and, and cancellation. So the whole website was translated into Russian. So of course we had an enormous peak from Russia, from people who were reading the parody on our website. So in a way, the side effect is always more attention. So it doesn't work at all, these cancellations and blacklists and whatever. It's so stupid. Yeah. So they don't block uh, visits to your website, they don't block some no. of Skype. We even have a Russian website, a Russian version of our website, because one of our translators, she voluntarily translated our entire website, which is actually a huge amount of text, into Russian. So I could even show it. Now our website is also in, uh, in uh, Russian, which is a fantastic thing. And we got a lot of uh, visits from, uh, from Russia as well. No, I will. Oh. And the laptop is on electricity, so... What is it? Any more questions? Otherwise, if you want to see, look into the books, uh, just do it here right now. And uh, thank you for all your attention. Books are also for sale, and preferably we don't take them home again. <laughs>